All right, good morning. I hope you uh, had a good day so far, and I hope you have a great weekend. Next week, Thanksgiving. Woohoo! So, uh, just to repeat, uh, we will have a 9 a.m. lecture on Monday, but there's no lab, no recitation. Uh, nothing like that. So only a lecture at nine o'clock. Nothing. Don't show up at one ten. Uh, yeah, that would that would be crazy. <laughs> uh, Mount Hood is totally closed Wednesday through Friday uh, for students and stuff. So if you have any classes, those will definitely be closed. So that's one of the reasons why we're not going to have a lab. Uh, you can take your time to work on your class presentation, which will be the Monday after Thanksgiving, or the calendar imagery lab stuff like that. Any questions before I start? Yeah. So no quiz? No quiz, that's right. Um, the last quiz, Yana, uh, will be the week after class presentations. Uh, so that would be, um, I think it's like first week of December, I think, something like that. Other questions? All right, so on uh, Wednesday, we talked about how frequency, wavelength are associated with energy. We talked about the speed of light, we talked about Planck's constant, and even more importantly, we talked about how light can really be thought of as little packets, all right? They're called quanta, depends on who you're talking to, but light isn't just a continuous thing, it's like little tiny pieces of light coming up, and they had different names over time, but that's the important part. Uh, very interesting, and Einstein was part of it, as well as Planck, of course, and all those people. We're now gonna look at one of the major players in this area, and he kind of opened the door for a lot of these things, and his name is Niels Bohr. And Niels Bohr, who, by the way, was in the Oppenheimer movie, you don't have to see it, but if you do see it, oh, oh yeah, famous, anyway. All right, prop that back on. Uh, anyway, Niels Bohr was instrumental in figuring out something called sharp line spectra. And sharp line spectra is, I think, something you may or may not have heard of before. The last lab we're going to do in Chem 221 is a sharp line spectral lab. So you'll get to see them then. But anyway, uh, what I want to do now is talk about what sharp line spectra are and then see how it affected chemistry and the development of how electrons go around atoms. All right, that's kind of where we're going. So let's talk a little bit here about Niels Bohr and sharp line spectra. Uh, light, that's white light, is usually a mixture of colors. And Newton was a person that used a prism back in the 1600s or whatever it was, and he separated light into different colors. And if you've ever had like a crystal, uh, you've seen the light come through it, that's the same phenomena. Uh, it's pretty cool. And light, as we saw on Wednesday, has many different colors uh, possible. White light, in theory, would be all of them. So you have red light to blue and islet, roy beef give, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, red light is usually the lowest energy, longest wavelength. Blue light is usually the highest frequency, shortest wavelength. And you can separate them out based uh, with prisms and stuff like that. The refraction angle, which is how much it bends basically, uh, depends on different wavelengths, energy, and stuff like that. That's not a big deal. But what I do want you to see is how white light usually is made up of lots of different colors. It's not just like one light. So if we took a prism to the lights overhead, we'd see all kinds of colors come out. Uh, all those colors together are what usually we take then as white. So. Here's a question that might you might see, uh, which of them will refract the least, all right? And uh, the short wavelengths will bend the most. The short wavelengths are the highest energy ones, so that's gonna be the red ones will refract the least. They will go basically straight on through. The blue ones will refract the most. Kind of chill. Uh, black light, if you hear about it, is actually a type of ultraviolet light. It makes your clothes look kind of purpley sometimes if you're in a black light. Uh, I just noticed this morning that in the old radio area over there, they have kind of a black light poster going, so. <laughs> but black light really isn't a light. It's an ultraviolet uh, thing that comes off and makes other things go. If we pour methanol onto sodium chloride and ignite it, the flame produced is yellow in color. Uh -huh. 
If instead of using sodium chloride, we use boric acid, a compound made of boron, hydrogen, and oxygen, the flame produced is green in color. Each salt imparts a characteristic color. The emission of light by heated or burning objects provide important clues to our understanding of atoms. If you sit around a campfire, kind of appreciate the warmth and company maybe or whatever, but anyway, the campfire itself has kind of a yellow tinge to it. And the yellow color actually comes from sodium. And each type of metal, especially, when you add energy to it, will create a color. So down here I have different types of flames, all right? So in this example, they first had a sodium chloride, and then they used, I think it was barium or whatever. Uh, but anyway, uh, the colors that come off of the flame reflect the types of ions that are inside. So you can have red flames, and you can have you know green flames and stuff. We're super used to yellow because there's a lot of sodium around us, all right? There's sodium in almost everything. And so that's where the yellow color comes from. But in theory, if you were on a different planet or something, and you had a thing, uh, something with a lot of lithium in it, you would see kind of a cool red flame going on. Yeah. Why does the sun appear to be yellow, like the like yellowish color then? Cool. Uh, the sunlight is diffracted and uh, by our atmosphere a lot, mm -hmm. and so that's the main cause of it. I think if you could go in space and look at it, it would be, well, first of all, it would blind you, so you don't <laughs> want to do that, but if you didn't have filters, I think it would just look like a white light and stuff like that, so that was, that's my non-physics 30-second description. <laughs> Other questions? All right, um, this phenomena is used a lot with different kinds of uh, like neon lights. If you've ever seen them, they can have all different kind of colors. Sometimes the things inside the lights have uh, are particular types of ions, all right? You can make things happen. Fireworks big time use this phenomena and stuff to make it happen. So you can change the color of the flame based on the type of ion. But you don't have to use a flame. You can also add like electricity to it. The sun doesn't have a flame per se, it's just basically a high energy source. So having the right kind of energy, you can see these colors come out, which is kind of exciting. If a high voltage is applied to an element in the gas phase, the element emits light. Using a prism, we can split the light into its component colors. Every element emits a distinct set of colors unique to that element. Now, this is kind of cool. Uh, this is not just a regular light like we have overhead. This is a hydrogen light bulb, if you will, all right? And let's talk about what light bulb means here a little bit more. If you take a glass tube, basically put a vacuum inside, and then put introduce some hydrogen gas, and if you have little leads on it, positive, negatives, you can add voltage across it and the voltage will create a type of a light, like a light bulb, a hydrogen light bulb, all right? Now they're really reactive and they're rare, uh, so we'll view some in lab, in this final lab, uh, and it looks kind of reddish and stuff, which is kind of a neat color, and you'll see this color, by the way, in lab. But for some reason, scientists thought, hmm, well, let's apply the spectrum to it, like Newton did. And what they did, what they found, is that hydrogen has one, two, three, well, excuse me, one, two, three, four sharp lines in the visible spectrum. There is a fifth line, we'll talk about that later, it's hard to see. But these four lines are easy to see, and you'll see them yourself in lab. And those lines are incredibly narrow when it comes to nanometers. So you can see here they have nanometers down to a tenth of a nanometer, which is just crazy. This is called a sharp line spectra for hydrogen. And all elements have sharp line spectra. Some have more than four lines, some have less than four lines, but they all have it. And you can use it like a fingerprint to identify what element, say, is in a sun or something like that, or on a different planet. Now this is a better picture here showing what I want to get across. This is like a hydrogen light bulb, okay? So again, someone made a piece of glass, they put a vacuum inside, and then they introduce some hydrogen gas. And they have kind of an electric lead, positives, negatives, they add the energy to it, and all of a sudden the light bulb starts glowing. It's kind of a red-purple color. It's, it's a pretty cool color, actually. Anyway, that's kind of neat and groovy, but 
then scientists thought, hey man, let's put this light through a prism. Now, the double slit is used when you want to get a plain polarized light. So light comes out 360 degrees in all directions. Plain polarized makes it into just like a very narrow plane, all right? And when you send this through the prism, the light is split into these four visible lines. And these are the things you'll see. A red, a green, and two kind of bluish, purplish lines and stuff. And this can be used as a fingerprint. So David has a bunch of these light bulbs hanging around in his house. The, they're so old, the tags wore off. In theory, we could apply this kind of process and figure out what kinds of lights they were using. So hydrogen would have a distinct set of sharp lines separate from helium, which would be separate from sodium, stuff like that. All four of these lines together make the kind of red-purple line that you're going to see but the individual lines can be separated out. So these are what they call sharp line spectra, all right? You see a light bulb, it's got all kinds of colors to it, but if you place it through a prism, wow, you get some very narrow lines that makes the different colors. Okay. So these nitrogen bulbs, I'm guessing, the light, the light that we're seeing from them is a combination, not equal combination, of X kinds of lights put out by the prism. Cool. I, I would guess that to be the case. I, I don't know specifically, but that would sound very reasonable to me, Gabriel. You bet. Cool. All right. <clears throat> Here are the lines. Um, the big ones are the red one, the green one, and two blue or purple, depending on who you talk to. We'll talk about why there's other lines in a little bit, but we're going to talk a lot about hydrogen's four sharp lines. And scientists have known these uh, since the 1800s and known them to a lot of pretty good precision, down to a tenth of a nanometer, sometimes more. And again, every element has its own set of colors. Now, let's remember that wavelength and frequency and energy are all related. Wavelength is getting bigger as you go to the right. And as wavelength goes up, the frequency of the energy goes down. So as you get go left to right here, you can see these numbers are getting bigger. The wavelength value is increasing. As wavelength gets bigger, you get to smaller frequencies, all right, because they're inversely related. Wavelength, excuse me, times frequency equals the speed of light. It's a constant. So as one goes up, the other one has to go down. So wavelength's getting bigger, that means frequency is getting smaller. So frequency, you could argue, gets bigger as you go right to left. Wavelength gets bigger as you go left to right. Now, energy and frequency follow each other. Energy equals H times frequency. H is Planck's constant. So as frequency gets bigger, the energy gets bigger. But wavelength is the opposite of frequency. So as you get bigger wavelengths going left to right, you have smaller frequencies. The energy is also getting smaller as you go to the right. So think about this in the back of your minds and stuff, really, really important. Um, the visible lines in hydrogen are called the Balmer lines. Balmer was a scientist who was the first one to discover it and measure pretty high accuracy. Uh, what they were. And again, it's amazing how, uh, how sharp they are. All right, you'd think it would be kind of a broad band, but it's actually very sharp lines and stuff that make this possible. Now, here are some examples of other elements. All right, so the top one up here is hydrogen. There's the red kind of green and two blue or purple, basically four lines in the visible spectrum. Mercury has a bunch of lines. You can see right here, it's got two or three purples and blues, a whole bunch of greens, several reds and stuff. And helium has even more, which is just crazy. So every element has its own set of sharp line spectral lines. Here's neon down here. You can look up just about anything on the internet, of course, to see. Uh, so it's a really an amazing thing. Scientists have done a lot with this uh, in order to figure it out. These are called emission spectra. All right, we'll talk about what that means in a little bit here. But in theory, like I said, every element and even most compounds should have a distinct set of these sharp line spectra, which is kind of cool. In astronomy, this is critical. You can't go traveling to Alpha Centauri or something like that, right? You have to use uh, starlight that comes in stuff to see. 
Well, starlight has these little element pieces in them inside. And using super high calibrated uh, things, you can see there's lots of little lines in the spectrum. And scientists, astronomers can figure out then that, oh yeah, there's nitrogen on Mars or something like that without actually going there. Now, of course, we've been to Mars, so that's maybe not the best example. These spacecraft have, but you don't have to actually be there, which is cool. Um, astronomers do have to deal with something called the Doppler effect. And in physics, you'll talk about this. Um, as a train goes by, it goes like the frequency of the sound is changing. Sorry, dumb sound effect. Anyway, uh, in sound, this happens, and it happens with light as well. As things are moving, it gets really crazy. So you can see how these things are going nuts. But anyway, it's a, this is how they can figure out that other planets and other systems have these kind of atmospheres. And they think they found some Earth-like planets, and this is what they're doing. They're looking for oxygen, water, stuff like that. So. But this is the best example, <laughs> the electric pickle. Now, down here is a pickle. It's been soaked in sodium chloride, sodium, which is usually yellow like thing. And you can actually make the pickle glow. It's the coolest phenomenon. And uh, the pickle starts to smell after a while, so it's kind of a weird uh, smelling thing. But you can actually see the sodium in the pickle begin to give white like, colors off, which is just crazy. Now, the reason why, again, the pickle it glows yellow, all right, is because of the sodium. Sodium chloride, table salt, is used as a preservative when you pickle things. Uh, several years ago, I had a student who was really into, into this, and he soaked a pickle in potassium chloride. And potassium chloride is no salt. It's a type of salt alternative for people that have high sensitivity to sodium. And lo and behold, we did this, and the pickle actually turned kind of a purple color because the potassium makes a more purplish red kind of color. Uh, it was kind of neat. But anyway, what's happening here is you're adding energy. And just like with a fire making the yellow color, this is electricity. And electricity is also capable of making the sodium ions become kind of yellow. So. Anyway, so let's say that you have a pickle that's been soaked in barium chloride. And barium makes kind of a cool green color. It's used a lot in fireworks and stuff like that. So if you had to pick uh, which one of these uh, the electric pickle would make uh, if it was soaked in barium chloride, although it'd be fun to see a black flame, of course, because barium is green, it would be a green color. So it depends on mostly the metals that are inside it and stuff. The metals make the strongest colors and stuff. So if you had a pickle with barium chloride, it would make a green color because barium is green. Just like if you had a potassium pickle, it would become kind of a reddish purple, sodium would be yellow. Questions? Okay. So this was a really interesting phenomenon that stumped scientists for a long time. Like why are the elements having these sharp line spectrum, all right? Why are they all different? Stuff like that. And honestly, nobody knew. They could describe the phenomena. They had the wavelengths down really well, but they had no clue why these things were being made. So Bohr started to think about this in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. And at the time, uh, at the time of Rutherford and all these kind of people, Atoms were thought of, uh, once they got past the, uh, the Blumage kind of theory, they started to think about how, yeah, well, atoms must be in the half a cent positive centers in the middle, and they had uh, electrons running around the outside. And that's similar to what we use right now. This is a classical physics description of the atom, all right? And you can think about this as being like uh, planets around the sun. And gravity works really well. We can describe how Mars and Earth and all these kind of things go around the sun using gravity. So they thought, hey, let's do this for these kind of things as well. An orbit was used, but there's a problem in using the planets around the sun idea with atoms. In theory, if you had a planet around the sun, you could have it out to the depths of Pluto or into as close as Mercury, and you could have any orbit possible, all right, according to classical physics. 
But the one thing that they didn't think about at the time was that a proton is positive and the electrons are negative. And anytime you have positives and negatives going on, there's energy interactions, all right? And if you're going to start having electrons going around, that electron's going to build up energy. And after a while, it's going to emit the energy off. And if that happens, the atom would break down, all right? Either the electron would go shooting off into something or it would break down, it would break, break up the atom itself. So classical physics predicted that atoms shouldn't exist. And that sounds ludicrous, but that's what classical physics thought. Uh, using regular positive, negative electrostatic interactions, it seems that atoms shouldn't exist. But thankfully, all of us here have atoms in our bodies. Atoms do exist. So we needed something better than classical physics to describe the atom. And that's where Bohr just came in. He says, well, classical physics is wrong. Let's make up a new theory. And it's now called quantum mechanics or wave mechanics. And while classic physics is great for planets around the sun, getting the space shuttles or, and spacecraft into orbit around the Earth, quantum and wave mechanics is much better for really, really small things. And one of the great areas of physics they're trying to incorporate is how to make these two worlds mesh up, but that's another story. So Bohr just said, screw this, we're dropping that theory, we're starting a new theory, quantum mechanics. And what Bohr postulated as part of this new philosophy, if you will, is that electrons can only be in discrete orbits from the nucleus, which he called stationary states. Now, Let's use an example here. Let's say that genum is the, is the nucleus of the atom and I'm an electron, all right? Well, in our day-to-day -day world, I could be any distance from genum. I could say, hey, genum, what's going on? Or I could go back here and say, yo, what's going on? Happy Friday. All right, any distance from me to genum is possible. And that makes sense in our world. But what Bohr said is that maybe I as the electron could be here, and maybe I could be as the electron right here, but I couldn't be right here. And that's weird, all right, for our day-to-day -day world, because you should be able to be any distance, all right, from it. But with electrons, for whatever reason, you can only have certain places that are allowed, like here and here, but not like in between. And nobody had thought about this before in this kind of context at all. Quantized energy states just means that only certain positions are possible, all right? Like you can be this close or that close, but you can't be in between. So quantize just means you have discrete levels that are possible. And Bohr was actually able to figure an equation that describes the sharp line spectra beautifully for hydrogen. And this equation, which is sometimes called the Bohr equation, but you don't have to worry about that, energy of these quantized energy states, energy equals minus RHC over N squared. Now, R is called the Ryberg constant. It's that number right there. You do not need to know slash memorize it because we're not going to use it a lot. But if you do need to use it, that's what it is. H is Planck's constant. C is the speed of light. And N represents how close you are to the atom. So if I'm an electron and Gina is the neutron, N equals one would be as close to her as I can get. N equals two would be the next allowed state I could be at. But I couldn't be at like 1.5 or 1.25. You have to have these whole numbers N to describe where the electrons can be. And that seems really strange. So I wanna talk about here a little bit about how people can use the Bohr equation to figure out what's going on with the sharp line spectrum. Now, as a quick review, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. We will use those two constants a lot, so you need to know slash memorize those. You do not need to worry about the Rieber constant. Um, the Rieber constant is cool for this, but there's other things going on. And then N is literally a whole number, all right? One, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Never zero, never negative, never fractions, whole numbers. And using this, you can do uh, some really neat things. Now, after Bohr, uh, other people did some 
cool stuff after that. We'll talk about those in a little bit. All of Bohr's stuff fits really well with the more modern equations. Um, Rydberg is a little bit more detailed. We'll talk about why that's not used. But Bohr was ahead of his time. And again, uh, as we're going to see, this Bohr equation was used to describe where these sharp line spectra were coming from. No one had been able to figure out even a math equation to do it until Bohr came along. And even though Bohr's stuff has been incorporated now in different ways, uh, it still is seen as kind of the premier way of understanding what's happening in the app. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, these results, using this equation, we can use this to understand where the sharp line spectra came from. And this is super cool. So we're going to use this equation a lot to talk about hydrogen, because hydrogen is pretty simple relatively to talk about. And you can see how all this stuff popped out. Get as excited about it as maybe I am. All right. Here is a little picture. Now, earlier I said that Gina was the nucleus and I was an electron. This is going to be a little animation showing this process, all right? So instead of Gina and Michael, this will now be the nucleus, the positive energy, and this will be the electron, the negative energy. Now, what's really wild here is that if you have quantum states, you can start to figure out the energy transitions that are possible using the Bohr equation. And E equals minus RHC over N squared, you can figure out the energy for this level. Remember, RH and C are just constants. So those constants, C here, divided by 1 squared, we could use that to find this energy value. And we could use the same thing up here. We'd have 2 squared or 4, and this one would be 3 squared or 9. So you can figure out the energy of this level, the energy of this level, this level, this level, etc., etc. And what we're going to do now is figure out the energies of transitions as, say, the electron goes from 1 to 2 or from 2 back to 1. But let's think about thermochemistry here just for a second. If I'm this close to Gina and a positive-negative thing is interacting and I move back this far, all right, is it going to take energy? Is it going to get me away or will I release energy going farther from Gina? That, well, yeah, uh, so there's a positive-negative attraction, and as I step back, I am now farther from, uh, from her. So in order to make this happen, you're going to have to add energy to make it happen. Like, I like to talk to Gina. Get away from me, you weirdo. <laughs> uh, so you push energy and stuff. So, uh, why this is important is that if you go close to the nucleus to farther, endothermic, it takes energy to get away. All right. Now, Gina is the coolest person ever, so if I end up going back to Gina, I'm actually going to release some of that extra energy. So one thing I want you to see is that these little dots, N, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, anytime you go up in N, endothermic, anytime you go from a higher N to a lower N, exothermic. What's the sign of endothermic energy transitions, positive or negative? Positive. positive, that's right. Going from 1 to 2 will be positive numbers, just like 2 to 3, 2 to 4, 1 to 3, any of these kind of things, always positive. On the other hand, the opposite, going from 2 to 1, 4 to 2, 3 to 1, those are exothermic negative numbers. So think about that in the back of your mind. Electrons really want to be close to the nucleus, close to that positive attraction. Negatives, positives attract. So if you're going to push it away, it's going to take energy, endothermic. On the other hand, if you can have a farther away electron go closer, you're going to get energy out. So positive numbers going from low end to high end, negative numbers going from high end to low end. And that'll be important here coming up. According to the Bohr model, when a hydrogen atom receives energy, its electron leaps from a low energy orbit to a higher one, forming an excited state. As the atom loses energy, the electron jumps back to a lower energy orbit, releasing light as it goes. When gaining energy, the orbit to which the electron jumps depends on the amount of energy involved. When the electron occupies the lowest energy orbit possible, the atom is said to be in the ground state. 
ground state electrons just mean they're in the lowest energy state possible. And for hydrogen, that would be at the n equals one level. All right, you get the maximum positive negative attraction at n equals one. But if some energy comes in from a cosmic ray or from electricity or whatever, that electron can jump to a higher level, two, three, four, all the way up a large, a large part, we'll see. All of those things from lower end to higher end take energy. They're gonna be endothermic. They're gonna be positive energies. It's not gonna happen by itself. But after a while, electrons hanging out at n equals four, they went, wow, I really miss home. I wanna go back to n equals one, the ground state. Going from higher end to lower end, all that extra energy is released. So those are all gonna be exothermic numbers, negative numbers when we calculate them. So electrons like to be down here. If they get energy, they go to a higher energy state. But after a while, they go back to their home base, if you will. That's going to release energy, and those will be negative. Yeah. So we're talking about n equals three. We're not talking about orbitals yet. So hold off. Right now, all we're doing is we're talking about there's there's levels, okay? And the n equals three level is further from from the nucleus than n equals one. All right. We will get to orbitals totally, but we're not there yet. So hang hang tight. <laughs> Sorry to tease you on that. Other questions? Cool. These uh, right now are the, if you know about orbitals, these are the shell numbers that we, um, if you've seen this kind of stuff before. But if you haven't seen this before, just ignore what I said. All right. Now, what, you want to figure out how much energy it is? Fantastic, let's do it. So let's say that we have an electron that's in the n equals two state, a higher energy state, and we want to calculate the energy that's either going to be given off or absorbed going from two to one, all right? Now, higher n to lower n, always negative numbers. Energy is released. So we can use the Bohr equation. Now, we're gonna have to have a delta energy, final energy state minus initial energy state. The initial state was n equals two, that's where the electron started. And the final state was n equals one. So delta E is gonna be final energy minus initial energy. Now, each of the energies is minus RHC over n squared. Let's do it per mole. So I'm gonna throw in Avogadro's number as well. That's what L stands for usually, a lot of times in these. Final state is going to be the first state because that's where the electron's ending up. And the initial state where it started is two. So you can see what's happened here. It's one over two squared because the initial is two, one over one squared because the final state is one. 1 minus 1 half is 3 fourths, all right? Uh, we're going to pull out the minus RHC and L. If you do all this, and this would be a fun thing to do on the weekend if you're totally bored, although probably the new Godzilla TV show would be better. But anyway, profat.com, minus RHC L times 3 fourths, turning joules into kilojoules, negative 984 kilojoules per mole. And what's really amazing is that this energy corresponds super well with the second energy level electrons going to the first energy orbital electrons. It's exothermic. The higher energy state is going back to its ground state, the lower place. Anytime you go high to low, always gonna be negative exothermic numbers, which is kind of interesting, so. Remember, RHC and L here are all constants. R is the Ryberg, H is Planck's constant, C is speed of light, L Avogadro, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. We're also throwing in a joules to kilojoules to make the number a little bit more manageable. Oh boy. Questions? Okay. Now, Here's a picture showing the electron initially in the ground state, n equals one. So down here by where it says ground state, that's where the nucleus is. As the electron is pushed to a higher state, you have to have energy absorbed. Energy has to be coming in, an endothermic process. On the other hand, after a while, the electron says, man, I wanna go home again. So it goes, wants to go back to the n equals one level. That's exothermic. And again, notice the energy. 
If it was negative 984 going from 2 to 1, it's going to be positive 984 going from 1 to 2. One direction is endothermic, opposite direction exothermic. All these things still apply. And this is pretty exciting. So you can actually figure out now the energies required for electrons to either jump to higher levels, which will take energy positive numbers, or give off energy if they go higher to lower. Now, you can go even more because scientists have been studying the wavelengths of these things for a long time. So we can use this kilojoule per mole energy to figure out the frequency and the wavelength of the photons. Now, if you see a question like this, this number right now is per mole, all right? You need to convert the kilojoules per mole into joules per photon. So it's totally doable. You can first of all multiply by a thousand to get joules per kilojoule. Then you can use Avogadro's number. You wanna divide this number by Avogadro's. The energy per photon will always be a really small number. So if you do that, here first of all, this number times 10 to the third would be joules per mole. And a mole has 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. We're also gonna divide by Planck's constant to get the frequency. If you do all of this, 2.47 times 10 to the 15th is the frequency. Now, if you're really astute with your math, there's a negative sign right there that I have conveniently ignored going to frequency. Frequency and wavelength, most of the time, are considered absolute values. You can have a wavelength that would be this far in one direction, which would be a positive length. On the other hand, you could have it go the opposite direction, which would be a negative length. And scientists usually just absolute value both the wavelength, how long it is, even though it could be negative if you went the other way, they usually just absolute value it. And remember, frequency is the number of waves that go by per time. Well, you could in theory have negative waves if you were looking at it from the opposite direction. But again, people usually just absolute value both frequency and wavelength. Questions on that? Once you have the frequency, then the speed of light divided by the frequency will give you the wavelength. Now, initially the number comes out to be in meters. I've turned meters into nanometers because that's what a lot of times these are represented as. And the wavelength associated with this transition comes out to be 122 nanometers. And again, what's just crazy about this is that Bohr in the early 20th century came up with this model and it works super well for frequency and, and wavelength. It's amazing how close it is. Initially, it looks like it might be a negative wavelength, just like this would be a negative frequency. But again, the convention is usually for frequency and wavelength just to absolute value them. If you recorded it as negative, it's not the end of the world, but it is better to absolute value them. So, in this example, which is a little weird, uh, this is the kind of stuff we'll do, and it's a good idea if you can go through the math just to make sure you've knocked it out uh, right on. Kilojoules to joules, important. Moles to photons, using Avogadro's, also important. Planck's constant, speed of light, and meters to nanometers. If you can knock those down, you've got this section take care of, all right? And again, if you can go through this example and get these values, that's awesome. Remember that frequency and wavelength are usually absolute value positive numbers, but it's not the end of the world. Another thing we're gonna start thinking about here is that as you go from lower to higher end, the process is really called absorption. And if you go from higher end to lower end, the exothermic, those lines are called emission. And in this particular section, we're gonna focus on the emission lines because emission lines, you see something. The lights overhead are all emission spectrum coming down on us. You see the light, you can you know, write your stuff or, or whatever, all right? Or the stuff from your phone even is emission. Absorption, you don't see anything, all right? Uh, you can measure absorption just as easily as you can emission, but it's not as exciting. You don't see the stuff coming through. 
Um, in biology, if you ever use the SPEC21s, and we'll use SPEC21s in the spring, SPEC21 is basically an absorption spectrometer. It measures the light that's being absorbed. But emission is the, are the light bulbs that you see. When you plug something, you see the light. <laughs> That's why in this, pro, in this section, we're mostly going to look at emission. But absorption is just the endothermic version of emission. Questions on any? OK. So here's a kind of a question you might see. And it says, which diagram, A or B, represents an emission line? Now, is emission an endothermic or exothermic transition? Exo, nice job. And exo means that energy is being released. Exothermic means you're going from a higher end to a lower end. So A here is an emission line. Higher end to lower end, the electron is actually kicked out. It kicks out energy. To get the electron from n equals 1 to, say, n equals 4, you have to add energy. It doesn't want to leave the nucleus right here. So it's going to take some energy. This is absorption. You'd have a positive number going from 1 to 4. But if you have a higher end to a lower end, it doesn't have to go back to 1 necessarily. All of those would be exothermic lines. Those would be negative numbers. Keep that in the back of your mind while we think about this stuff. Questions? So again, emission and absorption are just mere images of each other. Emission is the exothermic version, which is what we'll look at mostly in this section. And absorption is just the positive endothermic values. Um, down here, you can see some examples of absorption spectrum. And when you have an absorption spectrum, you usually see these dark lines. Those are the light that's being absorbed. Right? It takes energy to make those happen. In emission lines, you would usually, you wouldn't see all these background colors, you would see the sharp line spectrum. So emission and absorption are just exo versus endothermic versions of each other. They're both really cool. They're both used a lot in like forensics and in chemistry to detect different molecules. Questions? Sometimes people think of these as like ladder transitions, all right? And the ladder here would represent like n equals 1, the closest one to the nucleus, which would be like the floor, I guess. And n equals 2 would be the second step, third step, blah, blah, blah. The problem with the ladder idea, though, is if you look at these levels, 1 to 2 is a pretty big gap, and 2 to 3 is big. But notice how they're getting closer to each other, all right? As you get higher in n, because of the 1 over n squared, Square dependence if you're a math person, the levels do get closer to each other. So like a ladder has even steps, the steps get closer to each other as you get higher in n. But what's super cool about Bohr's model is that when people went crazy with these different energy levels and they figured these values out by minus RHC over n squared, by the way, they realize that hydrogen's visible emission line, sharp line spectrum, all happened when you had an electron at a higher n and ending up at n equals 2. So scientists went through and they figured out delta E, where the initial was 6 and the final was 2. And when they converted the energy into a wavelength, bam, 410.2 nanometers, which is one of the emission lines. And on the other hand, the red line, which is on the other side, 656.3, that happened when the electron started at n equals 3 and went to n equals 2. And these calculations were just amazingly close to the value, like almost exactly the right end. Now, I showed some other lines. Those were all higher electron levels ending at n equals 1. And on the other side, you had higher end values ending at n equals 3. Those lines are usually more infrared. These lines are usually more ultraviolet, so they're harder to see. But again, scientists now could start accounting for the emission lines that were possible, which is just incredible. So the punchline of all of this, Bohr came out with this equation. 
totally out of left field. He said, well, electrons must be quantized into orbits, the or shells and stuff like that. I, Natalie called me on the orbits, which was a good thing. I, they're really shells and stuff like that, which are like levels, all right? He had the energy of the level, these numbers right here, the delta E, final minus initial values can be calculated. You can turn them into wavelengths, and lo and behold, the four lines of the Balmer series, the visible spectrum of hydrogen, all happen when electrons are at higher levels and they end up at n equals two. So the three to two is the red line. The four to two is this kind of greenish line. The uh, five to two and the six to two are the two kind of purplish lines. And it nailed it. They had studied Balmer lines and nobody had a clue. Balmer came out with this thing that worked really, really well for hydrogen. Blue scientist mind. Bohr is a major player in this stuff. Questions on any of that? Okay, so Bohr totally rocked the world. <laughs> All right, Nobel Prize, absolutely, 1922. Great thing. But the problem with Bohr's theory is that it really only worked for single electron atoms. Excuse me. Excuse me. So hydrogen, which is what we've just been talking about, it works really well. Helium plus one, it works really well as well. But the minute you get to helium with two electrons, or carbon with six, or magnesium with 12, et cetera, et cetera, it kind of breaks down. It doesn't work as well. So it really only worked for single electron atoms. Oh, gosh, excuse me. He also threw in this idea of quantum levels artificially. No one had any explanation for why there was n equals 1 and n equals 2, but not like an n 1.5, all right? He kind of just threw that in ad hoc, which means it fit the model, which was fine, but there wasn't really like a reason why this happened. So Bohr definitely opened a door, but he didn't get us all the way through the door, if you will. So what we're going to do now is go on and talk about the current version that's used, quantum mechanics or wave mechanics. Quantum mechanics is sometimes called quantum chemistry or these kind of things. It's all the same thing. But what we're going to start doing is start applying waves to understanding why there's these weird quantum shells, like why you can only be at n equals 1 or n equals 2, but not n equals 1.5. But first, I need to drool a little bit here about this guy, de Broglie. De Broglie was some kind of, all right, I need to relax here a little. De Broglie came from a very uh, affluent background and uh, he went into chemistry, which is a testament to his, te to his character. But anyway, de Broglie came up with this idea that was so simple and yet so profound, it's amazing. Now, de Broglie at the time was writing his doctorate thesis. And if you're ever in my office, I can show you my thesis. It's like 400 pages. It was uh, blood, sweat, and tears for a long time. De Broglie's thesis, seven pages. Ah, ah, mm. anyway, it's all right. I, it was, writing a thesis is a very involved process. But anyway, what de Broglie thought about was, hmm, well, energy equals h nu, which equals hc over lambda. We've seen that. Einstein has another theory we'll use in Chem 222, E equals mc squared. But what he realized was that both of these have an energy part. So he put those together, he put mc squared equals hc over lambda. And if you do that, one of this, this c cancels, and this goes down to just one c, where you have mc equals h over lambda. Now, if you have a particle, something with mass, you can't go the speed of light. So they changed the speed of light to a speed v, and he came up with this equation, wavelength equals h over mv, for particles traveling less than the speed of light. Now at first you're like, whoopie do, Russell. <laughs> Come on, it's Friday, give me something exciting, man. All right, here's why this is exciting. As you watch me walk back and forth, and I haven't had too much caffeine or alcohol, it's not five o'clock, you don't see me swaying, all right? At least you shouldn't, anyway. But what Broglie is saying is that particles with mass m, and I have mass, particles with mass m should have wavelengths associated with them, all right? Because you've got some object with a mass, 
traveling at some speed, it's going to have a wavelength. And nobody had thought about this. And his advisory committee didn't know what to do. So they sent it to Einstein. Einstein looked at it and goes, give this guy his PhD. And he started working with Einstein after that. So de Broglie and his seven page thesis are just incredibly cool. Uh, they have given stamps for him and stuff like that. He's definitely a good guy. Um, now, why you don't see me swaying with a wavelength, all right, is because Planck's constant is so small, all right, that it takes a really small and fast object to see a wavelength. So let's say we have an electron. This is the mass of the electron right there. And let's say the electron is traveling at 75% the speed of light. So this is the speed of light, and I'm going to multiply it by 0.7575%. Well, Planck's constant divided by all that jazz, you get a wavelength of 3.23 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. And that's really, 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 really small, as you can imagine, and really, really small. Now, uh, electrons, you can actually measure this value. It's something that science can do. But me, with a larger mass, much larger than 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, I'll tell you, uh, you wouldn't be able to see an appreciable wavelength and stuff. So it only this de Broglie equation only really is effective when you have really small items traveling at really fast speeds. Um, a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So if you see this kind of conversion, that's where they're getting all these units and stuff taking them into account. All right, we will look at this more on Monday. Uh, thanks for being here. Have a great week.